thanks very much, uh, Bill. Um, it's a great honor to be asked to do this. I was just looking at this meeting, uh, uh, the talks I've, I've uh, been in, and there's so many fantastic speakers here. It's kind of embarrassing to be asked to do this talk, uh, but what the hell, as they say. And uh, I almost put the plant slides in, actually, but uh, I don't have... Uh, uh, enough published yet, so I, I think that CV has to get a little longer. Now, okay, I'm, I guess, oh, here we see, I see all the equipment. I've got it, don't worry. Don't panic, it's okay. <laughs> so, um, I, as I said, thanks very much. It's, it's an honor to be here, and uh, it's nice to be in Italy, obviously, again. Um, so I'm going to return to a topic which we've had lots of discussion about, and so some very quick reminder slides before we get into the, to the work itself. But you all know that uh, sensing of uh, uh, microbes on the one hand and damage to tissues and things like that are really important in, in the nature of uh, determining the nature of uh, inflammation and immunity. And, uh, just as a reminder, of course, we, uh, we, we went from, we have transmembrane receptors which do this and we have cytoplasmic receptors which do this. Now, I'm going to be talking about nod-like receptors, which is uh, the proteins that um, uh, drive uh, inflammasomes. Uh, whoops. Uh, you've seen several talks about this, again, as a reminder slide. Uh, mammals have of the order of, uh, you know, tens of genes which encode these proteins. But these are a very ancient uh, class of molecules and uh, uh, our, our very, very ancient ancestors, deuterosomes, uh, uh, um, organisms such as uh, sea anemones and urchins and this kind of thing, they have hundreds of genes like this. And um, is this the point? Yeah, yeah, this is a bit brighter. So hundreds of genes are, are, are in their genome, and w which uh, play probably a very important role in, in, in recognition of uh, infectious agents and, and dealing with them. Uh, relatively understudied, obviously. And plants also uh, have uh, such uh, molecules as well. And so this is a very old idea, and uh, one that's obviously worked over many millions of years. Uh, the classes of these molecules um, are, consist of really two kinds, uh, pyrin domain carrying proteins and uh, card domain carrying proteins. This is an example, whoops, I keep going. This, this is an example of uh, a pyrin carrying uh, NLR, NLRP3. The terminology is that NLR stands for nod like receptor or something like that. The P stands for pyrin and this is gene number three, and this is one that's very well known, you've heard about multiple times at the meeting, drives caspase activation, caspase one, then cleaves its substrates, IL-1 beta and IL-18, and they will then be released from cells uh, in, in a still somewhat mysterious process. Uh, a second output from this is cell death, and you've heard many excellent talks uh, which, which study this. The second class of molecules, uh, are these uh, card containing ones such as NOD1, NOD2, and those proteins will have a designation NLR and then the C, just so you know. This is an older slide with older terminology. So um, we can thank Jörg Chop for the beautiful work which led to this uh, discovery of uh, the, the mechanisms underlying uh, the, the, quote, the, what he called the inflammasome. And people think these days that these uh, molecules are, we know they're very large complexes, uh, many millions of Daltons, and it's thought that they have structures similar to the apoptosome, which is the um, uh, equivalent complex uh, from caspase 9 associated with cytochrome C and APAF1. And, uh, but this yet is, is, is yet to be uh, proven. Um, now, the interesting thing, of course, about these molecules, and, and, and NLRP3 is a very good example, is that they're able to integrate very large numbers of inputs. And the inputs consist of infectious uh, agents and the consequences of their infection, uh, so pathogen-derived activators, but also components uh, of ourselves, uh, which are the products commonly of tissue damage, for example, necrosis, causes ATP 
to be uh, released. ATP is an excellent activator of in, uh, inflammasomes like NLRP3. And, and so you can integrate uh, tissue damage signals, infectious signals, into a very simple output. The output is the, the inf inflammatory cytokines uh, like IL-1 and IL-18, or cell death like uh, paraptosis. And so for this reason, uh, long, uh, really several years ago now, we, we were thinking that this would be a wonderful way to try and maintain a homeostatic situation uh, in the body. And the place where we thought that such a thing was really needed was in the gut, where you, of course, have a vast number of microorganisms, 10 to the 14 or something like this, and somehow some kind of, of, of healthy relationship has to be maintained between us and our microbial friends. Our friends in the gut, of course, uh, feed us, because they take our food and modify it and give it back to us. Our immune system has to interact with them, and part of that homeostasis which occurs between the immune system and those organisms has to be uh, regulated by some uh, sensing mechanisms. And for that reason, we decided that perhaps it was this inflammasome system that could contribute to this because of its ability to see so many things and have such a simple uh, answer to them. And so uh, Iran Elinav, uh, several years ago, uh, came to the lab from Israel and uh, decided to tackle this problem and really to address whether the inflammasomes could contribute to the uh, solution to this problem. And he was successful in doing that. And I'll just summarize his work very briefly. Um, and what he found was that there's a, uh, an inflammasome pathway which functions in the epithelial cells of the gut. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit different to what we, uh, most of us had been thinking uh, in the field because uh, most inflammasomes had really been studied in uh, inflammatory cells, so in macrophages and so on, uh, NLRP3 being a classical example. Uh, however, what this NLR, NLRP6, is, uh, is found expressed in these epithelial uh, compartments and what it did is to activate IL-18 production through this system. And when this was functional, there was a healthy homeostatic circumstance. But when it was dysfunctional, then a, 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 what we call dysbiosis occurred. The organisms in the, in the gut changed their composition, uh, and uh, this led to inflammatory consequences. And so what was the evidence for that? Uh, the evidence for that was based upon the following kind of experiment, and I'm only going to show this very briefly. In fact, I won't be showing it at all since the projector's not moving. Ah, here we go. Okay. So it was a very simple experiment. We thought, well, if, obviously, if there's something going on in the gut uh, w where a homeostatic situation may be lost, then one needs to perturb the environment of the gut to see if what one can detect a susceptibility. And so we use DSS colitis, which you give a dextran sulfate, it causes damage, kills epithelial cells, exposes the contents of the gut to the uh, underlying immune cells, and that leads to inflammation. That's reflected in loss of body mass. And you can measure that very straightforwardly. It's quite quick. Uh, and this is a typical result for a wild-type B6 mouse, which is what you see here. Uh, and and uh, as a test case, we took the, this adapter molecule, AL ASC, which connects uh, many NLRs to caspase-1, uh, and to see whether if you have a knockout mouse which lacks this, whether it was more or less susceptible. And the answer was it was substantially more susceptible than a wild-type mouse. So this told us that we had a system in which perturbation of the gut led to a differential output. The interesting experiment was this one, if it wants to, well, Avanti, whatever you, what do you say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, bingo. So, um, this is now in stereo. Okay, so, oh, 
wrong one. So this, what you can see here, I'm sorry about this delay. What you can see here is that by putting these mice in the same cage, rather than having them in separate cages, what he found was that now, this, now that the outcome became homogeneous and the wild type uh, became sicker. So in other words, the, proxi the proximity of a wild type mouse in the same cage as a mutant mouse led to a mutant phenotype, even though they are genotypically different. And the con of course, that led us to suspect that what was going on here was there was an infectious component here that the mutant uh, transmitted to the wild type. And since mice eat feces, uh, a red one could readily imagine how such a thing could occur. So, um, uh, which one is it now? Oh, this one. This is, you, you have to be smart to use these things. This is a problem. <laughs> and the result that, that, that we found, uh, you know, just to summarize it, I'm not going to show you all these slides because it's published and uh, you, you can get the principle. So we did that experiment with all of these knockout mice. So basically what I showed you was this one. But if you do that with NLRP6 or Caspase 1 or IL-18 knockout mice, all of them give you the same result. So it's a complete, it's like it gives you a pathway essentially immediately. Uh, and um, everybody phenocopied everybody else. So that was nice and, and clear and suggested to us we had a pathway functioning in this system. We went on to do expression studies. I'll skip that for the sake of time. And determined that NLRP6 was expressed selectively in epithelial cells. We could show that at both at the RNA and protein level. And so what we had in, in, our, in our hands was essentially what looked like a pathway which led to IL-18 production, which was beneficial to the organism. Uh, and in its absence, you, got, you, you became susceptible to inflammatory bowel disease. And this is um, just one experiment to show you. This is really IL-18 that's doing this. This is one of these co-housing experiments, just showing a wild type in its own cage here or a wild type in a cage with an IL-18 knockout. So you see there's the same genetic difference, same, excuse me, genetically they're the same, the same phenotypic difference. And this is scoring by colonoscopy. You can see again, very obviously, uh, the co-housed mouse is much sicker. Um, IL-1 does not contribute to this. Uh, so it, this is an IL-18 game, not an IL-1 game. And this, uh, when we looked in the epithelial cells, you could see that uh, they actually uh, make IL-18s in the gut spontaneously. And if you had the mutation, uh, you lose uh, IL-18 production. There's some residual production we suspect is coming from the inflammatory cells. And that's a long story. We did lots of other experiments. These are chimeras to prove that that particular high expression was from the uh, uh, epithelial sources and so on. I'll skip that for the sake of time. Um, so that led us, to, of course, to, uh, since we'd postulated we had infectious agents, we had to go looking for these, and that was an important thing to do. So we teamed up with Jeff Gordon and Andy Cow in Jeff's lab, did a large number, amount of uh, uh, 16S ribosomal RNA, uh, ribosomal DNA sequencing, and came up with these organisms, which were uh, anaerobes of uh, the uh, Privatelaceae, uh, a taxon called TM7, and uh, very high differences between knockout mice or co-house wild type mice. These are p-values of 10 to the minus 12 or something like that, compared to the wild type, which favors very much other organisms. And these are individual mice that you're looking at by principal component analysis. And they are very different. Their composition of these two kinds of organisms, uh, which are the, the big differences that you see are very different than what you see in the mutants or the co-housed wild type mice. So there was a very clear uh, a dysbiosis ongoing in these animals. Um, this doesn't prove that these are the organisms that do this, but th these told us that they were very different. And that you can, uh, we were interested in these organisms because they had the guilt by association because they'd been associated in other previous papers in, in IBD or, or related uh, kinds of diseases. Um, if you kill the bugs, and this is using antibiotics, then you eliminated the susceptibility to the disease. And we're still working actually on proving which particular organism was responsible. But uh, very clearly, this was a microbially driven antibiotic sensitive uh, phenotype. Whoops. Um, when we, we went looking for the organisms, uh, we, we found by microscopy, both EM and by um, 
by, uh, by light microscopy, you find very close association of microbes, not in the wild type. This is an EM of a wild type crypt. Which is, these are goblet cells. These are pretty, these are pretty clean in the, in the wild type. But if you looked in the mutant mice, you find these colonies of, of, of microbes that look very much as Privatella should look with these black pigmented uh, uh, components in their cytoplasms, which, are, which is actually heme, uh, and uh, so on. So that was point one. Point one was we had a microbially driven uh, susceptibility to IBD. Just trying to get through this quickly, sorry. <laughs> um, second component is the inflammatory response, and that's what this slide tells us. Uh, this uh, shows, um, we, we did, an, uh, in those days we were doing array analysis, so we used arrays to determine what gene products were selectively present uh, in the disease circumstance, and we found several interesting genes. This is showing the inflammation, by the way. Most immune cells are up, uh, upregulated in number in, in the disease gut. This is not during DSS, this is in homeostasis, before such an experiment is started. Uh, but then we looked among these genes for the likely candidates that would drive this. And the best comparison, of course, was to compare a wild-type mouse with a genotypically identical uh, wild-type mouse, but which had the, bi the bacteria, because we wanted to find what was downstream of the bacteria. And CCL5 turned out to be the, the gene product that, that correlated it, and that turned out to be correct, because when you co-house the CCL5 knockout mouse, with an NLRP6 mouse, it doesn't get uh, hypersusceptible to IBD. Um, let, well, I won't bother going through all, all these points now because that was published then, uh, but suffice it to say that this mouse is unable to get that increased susceptibility even though it acquires the bacteria. So we, we, we showed that very clearly. The, 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 the amount of those bacteria is identical actually in these two uh, organisms by a variety of different criteria, all uh, DNA analysis. Uh, this is susceptible, that is not. So these, these mice are, in, are, of course, are identical. Um, and so this told us that there's a two-hit system here. Hit number one is microbes. Hit number two is the induction of an inflammatory uh, chemokine which draws in these immune cells which make the animal susceptible. So this is the model that, we ca that came out of this, and, and as you can see here. So the next question was, of course, that um, how, this is a, we'd looked in the gut. What, about, what was the relevance of this to the whole body? And, and lots of you know that um, there's quite a bit of literature which has accumulated over the years suggesting that microbial environments in our bodies, our microbiota, can have broad-reaching uh, consequences. And the things that uh, are here listed here that have been guilt by association again, so we decided to study various aspects of metabolic syndrome. Uh, and um, Jorge Hanal Mejia uh, collaborated with Iran. Uh, and um, I should mention, by the way, that the work I just described uh, uh, that Iran did was also a, a, an equal collaboration with uh, Till Strolweg, a German, wonderful German postdoc who just set up his own lab in uh, Germany, uh, in the, who is doing that now, actually. So, um, and the idea, of course, is that uh, our metabolic uh, system, uh, which drives metabolic syndrome, is in close affiliation with the immune system and uh, lots of correlation of low-grade inflammation with a variety of outcomes is what led us to, to want to consider this as a potential driver, the idea being that the dysbiosis in the gut could influence metabolic syndrome in the periphery. And so the first case that we went to look at was uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. This is one of the uh, best uh, predictors of uh, many... Um, oh, is it down there? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Excellent staff here, no? <laughs> so, um, now what do I do with this thing? All right, so, put it back. So, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as you can see on the slide here, it's uh, uh, it's fatty liver disease, which is a, found in a vast frequency in, in the Western population. 30-odd percent of the population, huge numbers of people have this disease. Uh, well, this syndrome, it, is, uh, uh, it can progress to steatohepatitis, which is really 
dying uh, liver cells, and uh, that can progress still to cirrhosis, which is, uh, of course, a disastrous outcome and, and leads to, uh, uh, can lead to cancer and death. So we decided to test that, and uh, I'll just give one slide quickly on this. So th this was the hypothesis that, they were gonna con that it would be the same phenomenon, and so we put mice on this diet, which, which allows you to model this. And the next slide just summarizes, whoops, yeah, here we go. So this is, uh, and this was the conclusion that Jorge uh, drew, and this, is, this was his paper, that th you have this increased severity of this non-alcoholic steatohepatitis in these mice, and it was transmissible. That's, that's the key second component. It was an inflammasome-driven phenomenon that was transmissible. And you can just pick one example here. This is looking at liver enzymes. Here's a wild-type mouse. Here's the mutant, which has higher liver damage. And here's the co-house wild-type mouse, which is the same as the mutant. It, it phenocopies the mutant, not the wild-type on its own. And this was true for liver damage, for fat in the liver. Here's steatosis and also for inflammation in the liver. So all three phenotypes are driven by dysbiosis in the same way as I had just mentioned for um, the, the gut uh, disease. Got too many things in my hands here. Um, so Jorge worked out the mechanism of this uh, and what he found was that um, this was driven by, not by bacteria going to the liver, we screened for that, we couldn't find them. Instead, what it was is we looked in, in the blood uh, of going through the portal vein and we found that there were enhanced levels of toll-like receptor agonists. And if you got rid of toll-like receptors in the, in the body, then you no longer had this transmission, this susceptibility of the, of the disease. So a toll-like receptor mutant uh, co-house doesn't get worse disease whereas a wild type does. So this is TLR4, this is TLR9. These were the two hits in toll-like receptors, not TLR5, which is enhanced, and so on. And this is the scoring of the agonists by Luciferase uh, Kappa B reporter uh, readouts. To make a long story short, uh, the product downstream of toll-like receptors was TNF-alpha. We showed that that was elevated. And this shows that if you look uh, again for the a causal role for TNF-alpha, which you can do by using a TNF-alpha knockout mice and co-house those together with the dysbiotic mutant donor mouse, then they also do not become hypersusceptible. And this is what Jorge showed, uh, and you can see it here. This is the liver enzymes in the TNF knockout. This is the, the wild type co-housed with the mutant, so this has the dysbiosis. Uh, they all have the dysbiosis, sorry, these two have the dysbiosis, uh, but when you co-house a TNF knockout together with the mutant, it doesn't become hypersusceptible. And this is true for all readouts, liver damage, fat, sorry, sorry, inflammation and fat. So this is a microbially driven, uh, truly uh, metabolic syndrome with liver fat, liver inflammation and liver damage. So this, this is kind of the model that developed from that, and you can see here um, that, um, that uh, you get these, uh, this dysbiosis. This activates this inflammatory component. Then materials come through this leaky gut into the portal circulation. They go through the, the portal veins into the liver and drive that process. As I said, through TLR agonists activating toll-like receptors, causing TNF-alpha production, and, and then driving the pathogenesis itself. So we wanted to um, identify bacteria. Again, we, we, I'm going to make this, again, make this brief. We found that indeed that there, there, were, the, 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 there were bacteria, obviously, which could be found in the organisms. Interestingly, the diet changed the, the, the organisms and caused a great increase in porphyromodenaceae, particularly Parabacteroides uh, bacteria. And this is an interesting story, which we're still uh, working on, actually. Um, we also showed, and this is, I'm going to skip this slide, I think, that this wasn't just a lab diet that caused this. We found that it was uh, reproducibly, uh, we could cause this disease in um, genetic mutants, for example, which have uh, these are uh, 
DBDB mice, so this is the leptin receptor mice, they get very, they get fatty liver disease and obesity. And we, we showed that we could again make their disease worse by co-housing. So dysbiosis made them worse, made these mice worse. So no lab diet required there on normal food. Um, and it made them f have fatty liver, inflamed fatty liver. But the most striking thing is actually they got fatter. And you can see this here. This is looking at their body mass here at 12 weeks. Uh, they weigh around 10 grams more than the, uh, the uh, control, uh, which is not co-housed. So it's just co-housing makes the animal fatter. And uh, parallel to this, actually, uh, my, my grad student, Chung Chung Jin, a, a really wonderful uh, young Chinese woman who just got her PhD, uh, did this study uh, looking to see if this were true also for type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes obviously is a really important, one of the most important components of, uh, of metabolic syndrome and, and what affects, ruins the lives of, of very many people, makes life very, very difficult for people. And so she uh, uh, did the following sets of studies, and I'll, I'll, some of which are published, but I'll focus on the unpublished ones. Um, she showed that, first of all, if you look at body mass, uh, that if you uh, look at an ASK mutant mouse and compare that to a wild type, then the ASK mice get fatter. If you, this is on, now we're going from an MCD, this is the methionine choline diet, so we're going from that to a McDonald's diet, so this is now high fat diet, okay? And you can see here um, that they're, they're considerably fatter than the wild types, but if you give antibiotics, you reduce that weight gain, and the wild types and the mutants become uh, basically indistinguishable. Whole body adiposity, that's whole body fat, is higher in the case of these. Antibiotics normalizes that. Liver triglycerides, the same thing. So this is liver fat, whole body fat, and, uh, and uh, body mass. Muscle uh, mass, as you can see, was not much altered. Uh, and so Chung Chang measured a whole series of metabolic parameters. And uh, of course, if you're measuring diabetes, what you measure is things like fasting glucose levels, which you can see uh, are elevated in the mutant, fasting insulin levels elevated, glucose tolerance. Uh, it says, you know, you give glucose, the, the, we induce insulin, and the, the insulin tells the body to remove that glucose and do something useful with it. So the muscles take it up and so on and so on. Uh, however, the mutant mice are glucose intolerant because uh, they are um, uh, unable to uh, utilize that sugar. They're, they're so-called insulin resistant. And this is likewise an insulin tolerance test which shows the same thing. So that's the, the third um, outcome for these mice. These mice are, are now um, uh, basically type 2 diabetics. Uh, now, this again, the type 2 diabetes was susceptible to antibiotic treatment. If you antibiotic treat, the, you normalize the fasting glucose levels, you normalize the fasting insulin levels, and strikingly, you completely eliminate this glucose tolerance problem. You bring down, here's the mutant here, you bring down this, uh, this uh, abnormal glucose tolerance test to wild type levels. And, and so we have again a, a microbially driven type 2 diabetes going on in these animals. Um, as you might expect, if you treat with antibiotics, uh, you, you, you take the, the dysbiosis situation, which you can see on this high-fat diet, which again is, is somewhat different organisms because of the diet. Uh, but here's an ASK knockout. This is just PCA uh, uh, again. So here's, here's the mutant. Here's the wild type. If you treat them both, then you get indistinguishable populations. And we found a variety of classes of microbes, which I, wrote, I just haven't got time to go into now. Otherwise, we'll run out of time. But uh, very interesting outcomes. Um, the question again was: Is this a transmissible disease? Now we did co-housing experiments, and what we find when we do that is you get this partial transferability. So we switched to um, a different system, which is actually the most penetrant way of, uh, of transferring uh, the, the microbes. And that's, we, you did what we call cross-fostering. So at birth, what we do is the, take the, the pups, which are just born, so they're hours old, and we switch the mother. And so in this case, what we do is to take the uh, ASK knockout mouse pups and we put them in with a, a, a mother that's wild type. 
or we do the reverse. We put the wild type in, 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 the, uh, in the ask mother. So here I'm comparing for you the ask, uh, this is an ask knockout mouse which is fostered with an ask mother. So you take the ask and we put it with an ask mother. And those mice get, of course, uh, fat as I showed you. But the interesting thing is if you take an ask mouse and cross foster it at day one with a wild type mom, then you solve the problem basically. And of course what happens when you do this cross fostering is the mice um, are fed by the new mother, which is wild type, and that mother has a wild type microbiota because she's never seen uh, this source. And the pups, of course, acquire a microbiota from the mother, which um, gives this outcome. So at least in the time course that we do this experiment, which is, of course, uh, not the whole life of a mouse, but it's, uh, it's uh, long enough for this experiment, you can see that uh, the mice now lose this uh, ability to get fat. They, their, tri their triglycerides in the liver are normalized. The fasting glucose levels are normalized. And the glucose tolerance test here is like a wild type. So they, even though they're genotypically ASK knockout, they are phenotypically uh, wild type. Uh, and so again, the, the, if you establish very early in life that microbiota, then, then it's relatively stable enough, at least in this experiment set up, to, to make, the, make the mouse um, uh, phenotypically wild type. And I'll, I'll just skip over these slides, but, uh, but uh, just, just to emphasize, uh, if you um, do uh, these experiments, you could do, basically, f again, phenocopy these, uh, these mice with caspase 1 knockouts, IL-18 knockouts. You can do it also with NLRP6 mice. They all phenocopy, so it's the same pathway that we've been talking about uh, earlier in the, in the uh, talk. And it's not just any old inflammasome mouse, by the way, that gets this kind of phenomenon. NLRC4, this is a, this is a mouse that's very susceptible uh, 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 because it, it, it cannot make a response to uh, salmonella. So these mice, but it, it isn't involved in this pathway. So NLRC4 has a completely wild type uh, uh, kind of behavior. Um, the, the compartment in which this plays its role, actually, the, 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 again, is, is not the uh, inflammatory cell compartment because we did chimeras, as you can see here. Whoops, wrong one. Uh, uh, but if, look, if you look at weight gain, for example, and you, uh, and you transfer, um, so um, basically wild type bone marrow into a wild type or an ass knockout, you retain that difference here. Uh, so what it says is it's the body of the mouse that determines the phenotype, not the bone marrow compartment, which is, this is the bone marrow switching, this is uh, uh, wild type bone marrow into a, a uh, different body. And so this, compart th this uh, phenomenon, as, uh, as I mentioned before, is determined by the, the non-bone marrow de derived compartment of the animal. Okay, oh my God, too many bits and pieces, here we go. Uh, so again, th this, is, this, this really raises the, the issue, this is, i just shown you for, for, for um, uh, uh, liver disease, but basically what's occurring here is, is that this phenomenon is driving not only uh, uh, fatty liver disease, but driving a metabolic syndrome and effects far afield actually from the, uh, the animal itself, and we're still now, we've, we've now looked at the, at the uh, genotypic consequences of this with regard to type 2 diabetes, and now, we're now very interested in working out what the actual molecular events here, what are the drivers that are coming through here, which are responsible actually for the, for the diabetes phenotype. So I want to finish up by, by discussing cancer, and of course, colon cancer is a, is a huge problem. It's closely related to inflammatory bowel disease, and of course, IBD patients are susceptible to a particular form of colon cancer. And so we became interested in the connection between inflammation and cancer, and the question really is, is the microbiota really the driver of that? And so in order to test that, uh, Bo Hu, uh, uh, another grad student in the, the lab, uh, Ask this question, does this inflammasome deficiency associated microphora affect the risk of colorectal cancer in these cohouse mice? 
And so we used, uh, again, the, this uh, rather standard system. This is the dextran sulfate uh, system. But again, the difference is now what we do is we treat the mice first with a procarcinogen, azoxymethane, which induces mutations. So we give mutations, and then we give an inflammatory hit with DSS to provide the, uh, the, the proliferative signals that will fix those mutations and uh, recapitulate the progression of inflammatory, uh, in inflammation-induced cancer. So this uh, system uh, uh, works very nicely, and, and the answer dropped basically out uh, quite quickly. Um, and you can see one example of that here. So now what we, oh, whoops. Now what we see is that um, in ASK knockout mice, for example, there's increased tumorigenesis and it's transmissible uh, and uh, to a co-housed wild type mouse. So here's the, an example. This is, this, this is the mass of tumor. This is the number of tumors. And this is some pictures you can see here. Here's a wild type. Of course, they get, uh, they get tumors. That's the system. The mutant has significantly more tumors. Again, this is the dysbiotic mouse. And it's transmissible. That, that, that higher tumor score and number is, in, is entirely transmissible to a wild type. So in other words, the, the, the enhanced colon cancer you see in these animals is in fact driven by dysbiosis. And we mapped out all of these things. I'm going to skip through this because uh, I think you can predict what you're going to find. We, in short, what we found is this is the same pathway from NLRP6 to ASK to caspase 1 to IL-18, which drives this. And let's uh, go through those uh, fast to save time. So here's uh, NLRP6. You can see that, that is, these mice get more cancer, and they, get, they can transmit that trait completely to a wild type. Um, we did caspase 1. I'll skip that just to save time. Um, is it IL-1 or IL-18? Well, it's IL-18, just as I've been describing earlier. IL-1, again, does not contribute to this dysbiotic uh, phenomenon. il ones very important in the inflammatory uh, components, but not in this, in, in this uh, component here. It's IL-18 which is responsible. And again, it's the lack of IL-18 which allows this dysbiosis to occur. Um, was this bacterially driven? Uh, so we treated with antibiotics, and the answer is yes, if you treat with that. Antibiotics, you can drive down the enhanced number of tumors here. And um, it, it requires that second hit, the inflammation hit. We took CCL5 knockouts. You can see here, this is wild type, this is co-housed. If you put um, a CCL5 knockout in with a, a, a mutant, they don't have enhanced numbers of tumors. They have the same as a wild type. So this, again, is dysbiosis. On one hand, dysbiosis driving inflammation through CCL opening mecha mechanistically, well, it turns out that, that as you might expect, that there was, there was effects on proliferation of the cells that will become the cancer. And we did BRDU labeling and, and KI67 labeling to test this. So we treat with, with um, mutagen, then we give one cycle of DSS, and then ask straight after that, has this uh, dysbiosis driven up the response to this proliferative signal here? And the answer was yes. What you can see here is, here's KI67 for the two genotypically identical mice, both wild type, one co-housed with the dysbiotic mouse. This mouse it becomes dysbiotic. It gets more KI67, which you can see here, and it gets more BRDU incorporation because there are more epithelial cells in S phase. So it's, it's an, a proliferation drive caused by the dysbiosis. Why is that happening? Uh, well, we got interested in a couple of cytokines that could be responsible. Either IL-22 or IL-6 will drive a proliferation like this. So we went looking for the cytokines. And to make a long story short, IL-22 levels really, really weren't different in this model. IL-6 levels were definitely enhanced, both at the RNA and protein level. And um, the, if that's true, then is IL-6 causally involved? So we. To test that, we could treat with IL-6 receptor antibody in this early phase, and we did that. And you can see it, it completely takes away this enhancement. Here's the wild type, co-housed wild type KI-67. If you treat with IL-6 receptor antibody, you bring it right back down to wild type levels. So that proliferation is driven by IL-6. 
does it matter? Is IL-6 driving the disease? So we treated with, um, took these mice, let them develop uh, these, these uh, t uh, pre-tumors basically, and then treat with IL-6 receptor antibody and measure tumor numbers. And when you do that, um, you can see that here's, here's the uh, wild type, this is the control antibodies, uh, and you see the wild type levels uh, are unaffected, by the way, by IL-6, because IL-6 is not playing a role in non-dysbiosis-driven colon cancer. It's an interesting result on its own, actually. Uh, but if you have the dysbiotic situation, you bring it right back down again by eliminating IL-6. So the numbers of tumors uh, uh, comes way down if you treat with the anti-IL-6 antibody. So it's an IL-6-driven a, a tumor, increased tumor score and number. And finally, ah, bring out the dead. Oh no, you like these, I like these bells, keep going. Well, I'm, I'm actually nearly finished, I, it's not too bad. So final experiment basically is, is this a direct effect? Is this IL-6 signaling in epithelial cells which, are, which are, is causing this. Now, so the, uh, so the model is the bacteria get in there, they recruit inflammatory cells, the inflammatory cells respond to the uh, uh, microbial uh, uh, insult, and they make cytokines. IL-6 is the most important, we think. So if that is true, the IL-6 then, we predict, acts on the epithelium to drive uh, proliferation. Well, if that's true, then if we have an IL-6 receptor knockout on the epithelial cells, then there should be no enhancement. And so what we did is to co-house IL-6 receptor knockouts, on, only knocked out on the epithelium, uh, with the ASC knockout mice to see whether that changed things. And sure enough, it does. And you can see here, here's the wild type, uh, which uh, on its own, if you co-house, of course, that you get an increased number of, uh, number of tumors. Uh, the, this experiment done multiple times. And here's the, shows you if you have the villain Cree, uh, of, of, this is now a, a low level like a wild type, but this is the key. This is the villain Cree mouse co-housed with the IL-6, sorry, with the ASC uh, knockout uh, mouse. So this mouse lacks IL-6 receptor on its epithelial cells, and it's the same as wild type. So this says the model really is, is uh, correct. Um, and we, what we have is a three-hit system, really, in our, in our circumstance. And you can, you can basically see it here. These, the inflammasome mice have increased tumorigenesis, which is dysbiosis-driven. It's abolished by antibiotic treatment, so that's the first hit is dysbiosis. It's mediated by uh, CCL5, so it's an inflammation-driven uh, disease that's... Uh, so hit number two is really the inflammation downstream of the dysbiosis. And thirdly, it's driven by products of those inflammatory cells, IL-6 specifically, which is the third hit, the product of the inflammatory response. And, whoops. and so uh, I think you can really see that the way that this is working in this, this model. You have an altered microbial environment. You, you get transmissible bacteria. You drive inflammation. The, you get the IL-6 production, higher proliferation of epithelial cells, and cancer. So, basically what I've been talking about is, is very simple stuff. W what we're suggesting is that um, we have to consider in, in all of these chronic uh, diseases that can occur, at least in, in lab mice, and, and I suspect this all has to be true in humans. The question is to what degree, obviously, because humans are not eating feces normally, at least not in the restaurants you hope you frequent, though no guarantees. It's all a question of amount, remember. Um, is, um, we all have our own genotypes. These mice have a very severe genotype. They, they lose uh, a protection system in the gut, but we all have our own spe special genotypes, and that, of course, is going to influence the remainder of these things. The, inf the inflammatory response will be influenced by that. The microorganisms that live with us are influenced by the genotype, as we showed you. And finally, we have to remember our diet, of course, influences this and probably this as well, or well, not this, one hopes. Um, and so I, I think these very simple things can have a dramatic effect on, uh, as you can see, inflammatory diseases, metabolic diseases and even, uh, even a, a case, uh, certain cancers and of course one needs to look further than that. 
And so it's, it's relatively uh, striking in the way that this can affect uh, rather diverse uh, outcomes. So let me now finish and thank the people who were involved in, in, in these studies. Uh, this, uh, these were these just wonderful people in the lab. And uh, I mentioned in the beginning Iran Elinav. He, he was just a fantastic postdoc. He now has his own lab at the Weizmann in Israel. Till Strovig and he uh, t together worked out that first story about the dysbiosis and about the way it worked. They, uh, the, uh, Iran was then uh, joined by Jorge Henao Mejia. Jorge comes from Colombia originally. He's a physician a scientist from Colombia, became a PhD in the US, and uh, did a, just a brilliant job on this uh, project on the uh, fatty liver disease. And then Chung Chung Jin, uh, really a magnificent uh, young woman from China, uh, did all that work on, on type 2 diabetes, uh, only a part of which is uh, published, and she'll, she'll, she's sort of working, doing really nice work on the mechanism of that now. Bo Hu, also a young Chinese uh, student who also just got his PhD, did the work on, on the cancer. And Anya Hafemann uh, was actually a, 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 an undergrad from Germany who worked with Till and helped to, uh, Bo actually with this work. Loads of other people helped uh, in the lab. Uh, I want to particularly mention Jeff, uh, Gordon, and Andy, who really uh, got us going on, the, on the, uh, all the bacterial stuff, which we now do ourselves. But all of the ones I've shown you were done by Andy in Jeff's lab. And many other people at Wadge who helped us with the liver, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, basically, uh, that's the story. I've, I'm holding so many things in my hand, my brain isn't working anyway. Thank you very much for being so patient, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah.